Well, the Bush administration announced last night that the U.S. will soon go to war against terrorism. The media uh, have endlessly pounded on the theme that the U.S. must fight terrorism, attack and destroy terrorist networks, and potentially go to war uh, with nations that harbor or support terrorists. But there's been almost no discussion of just what everyone means when they talk about terrorism. Although Osama bin Laden has become the virtual embodiment of it in the eyes of the U.S. government. In other countries, Colombia, Iraq, East Timor, the occupied territories, the word might include more uh, than that one name. We're joined right now by Noam Chomsky, professor of linguistics at MIT, author of dozens of books and articles on U.S. foreign policy, political ideology, and terrorism. Welcome to Democracy Now! in Exile. No. Hi, Amy. How are you? It's great to have you with us, although on this very difficult occasion. Um, I assume you have read uh, what President Bush, and Bush said last night about terrorism going after um, not only um, individuals, but the countries that harbor and support them. Your response? Uh, well, uh, he, he doesn't actually mean what he said, of course. Uh, terrorism has a clear definition. It's clearly defined in the U.S. Code and U.S. Army manuals. Uh, it's defined, without going into the details, as uh, the resort to coercion or violence uh, against a civilian population uh, in order to achieve uh, political, religious, or other ends. Uh, and uh, by that definition, it would be... Uh, uh, impossible not to accept the statement of the uh, ex-president of uh, ex-prime minister of Indonesia, Abdurrahman Wahid, uh, that the United States is a terrorist state. In fact, one of the leading terrorist states by that definition, by our own definition. In fact, we even have a name for it. Uh, it's called low-intensity warfare, which is uh, a low-intensity conflict, which is actually official military doctrine. And there's plenty of examples of it. So he didn't mean that. What he meant is what's usually meant. Uh, we define terrorism, any, anyone defines terrorism as uh, acts of terrorism but, uh, that they don't approve of. Um, that's the practical definition everywhere. So he means acts of terrorism that we don't approve of, uh, we will go after by the means that he described. And there's no doubt that the event in question was a horrendous act of terrorism. One of the things that uh, President Bush said is that if you are not with us, uh, you are with the terrorists. Yeah. yeah, that was already said. We have uh, we're offering the world a stark choice, as the New York Times put it. Either uh, you're on our side or you're destroyed. Uh, there are precedents for that too. Can you talk about what this means for countries like? Pakistan, and, of course, Afghanistan itself. Well, it depends what the administration decides to do. I mean, you know, this is, we don't know. And, in fact, there are countercurrents, I'm sure. Uh, there must be, uh, there must be a strong current within the administration that's listening to uh, what they're being told by foreign leaders, by every specialist um, who knows the region, I'm sure, by their own intelligence agencies, uh, that if they... Uh, decide to undertake a massive assault, uh, which will mostly slaughter uh, innocent victims, in fact, victims of the Taliban. If that's what they decide to do, which is the easy thing, we certainly have the capacity to do that, uh, they will be answering the prayers of uh, bin Laden and his network and falling into what the French foreign minister the other day called a diabolical trap. Uh, uh, the reason is pretty clear. It will uh, it, it will lead to it's very likely lead to uh, uh, mo to mobilizing uh, uh, force. Uh, it'll en enable the terrorist networks to mobilize support, uh, appealing to the same kind of reactions that uh, one hears here when uh, natural ones when there's a, an atrocity. And that will escalate the uh, cycle of violence uh, in accord with a very familiar dynamic, uh, except in this case at a scale well beyond the usual, uh, leading to uh, 
uh, enormous crimes elsewhere and very likely much even worse crimes here. That's one possibility. Uh, I assume that there are elements in the administration paying attention to that. Uh, if not, if they lose, uh, and if there is a massive attack which will kill, you know, mostly uh, uh, Afghans, who millions of them are barely on the verge of survival, at the edge of survival now. Uh, it, as for Pakistan, with your question, uh, uh, well, nobody really knows, but it could very well lead to a uh, Taliban-style uh, revolt in Pakistan, uh, which could win. Uh, uh, and might spread to the Gulf region, maybe to Saudi Arabia, uh, at which point, the, uh, uh, quite apart from the um, horrible fate of the people involved, it will also lead to a threat to the world's, uh, to U.S. control of the world's oil supplies, which will never be tolerated. And at this point, we're off into, uh, you know, indescribable global war. That's a possibility. I don't predict it, but uh, it's not, it's not an outlandish possibility. We have to break for stations to identify themselves. Uh, we'll come back in a minute with Noam Chomsky. In our second hour today, we'll uh, be going to London to speak with journalist John Pilger. Uh, Tony Blair has come to the United States and visited Ground Zero yesterday. We'll go to Belgrade and hear from Jeremy Scahill, the response of uh, those who are also under a reign of terror just a year or two ago. And then we're going to speak with students around the country. Yesterday was a national day of student protest. You're listening to Democracy Now! in Exile. Back in a minute. In Exile Free Speech Radio, as we break the sound barrier of broadcasting just blocks from what used to be the World Trade Center. This is President Bush last night. And tonight, the United States of America makes the following demands on the Taliban deliver to United States authorities all the leaders of Al-Qaeda who hide in your land. Release all foreign nationals, including American citizens you have unjustly imprisoned. Protect foreign journalists, diplomats, and aid workers in your country. Close immediately and permanently every terrorist training camp in Afghanistan and hand over every terrorist and every person in their support structure to appropriate authorities. <laughs> Give the United States full access to terrorist training camps so we can make sure they are no longer operating. These demands are not open to negotiation or discussion. President Bush addressing the nation last night. We're speaking with Professor Noam Chomsky. Uh, Noam, you've written extensively about terrorism uh, that uh, the United States government uh, has supported or engaged in. Can you put this in historical context? Well, perhaps a good way to do it is to take, let's take one case which is not controversial because, in fact, there's a judgment of the uh, uh, world Court, the highest possible judicial authority, uh, condemning the United States for what it called the unlawful use of force, that's international terrorism. Uh, that the, the U.S., of course, this is the case uh, brought by Nicaragua against the United States. Uh, the U.S. rejected the judgment, of course, uh, escalated the uh, attack. Uh, Nicaragua went to the Security Council, which called on all states to observe international law. Uh, the U.S. vetoed it. Uh, so there's a world court and a security council declaration demanding that the United States cease its international terrorism, of course, dismissed. Uh, suppose Nicaragua, to put uh, President Bush's comments that you just uh, we just heard in context, let's imagine uh, that Nicaragua had uh, said the same thing and was in a position to do it. Let's say they had Mars behind them or something like that. Suppose that Nicaragua said that uh, given the decision of the world court, authoritative decision, Security Council resolution. Uh, the, they demanded with no negotiations that the United States hand over at once everyone involved in any way uh, in the uh, uh, international terrorist attack against Nicaragua, which was very serious. 
tens of thousands of people killed, the country virtually destroyed, uh, that inclu and that they allow Nicaragua to uh, uh, inspect uh, all U.S. military bases anywhere remotely in the region, all support systems, uh, the ideological institutions such as the New York Times, which was drum beating for the war virtually without exception, uh, and so on. Uh, how, how would we, and that if that didn't happen, the U.S. would be obliterated. Uh, that's a uh, compar that's rather comparable. Uh, how would we react? Uh, of course, you know, it's not a credible threat. It's only a credible threat when it's made by a, a superpower that's not under control. But the uh, cases are uh, not dissimilar, except that the attack on Nicaragua was far worse. I just read uh, in the news headlines a story from the British newspaper The Guardian about uh, the U.S. plans to press its European allies to agree to the military campaign to topple the Taliban regime and replace it with an interim administration under United Nations auspices. Um, uh, diplomatic cables from the Washington Embassy of a key NATO ally report that the U.S. is keen to hear allied views on a post-Taliban Afghanistan after the liberation of the country. Um, and it says that uh, the U.S. military strategy appears to entail supporting the campaign of the exiled 86-year-old monarch of Afghanistan, King Zahir Shah, to return to power by encouraging the guerrilla army of the Northern Alliance opposition to fall in behind him. Diplomatic documents show that Washington is funding and organizing the travel of several Northern Alliance figures to Rome to confer with the exiled monarch, who's expected to call on all Afghan tribes to rise up in revolution against the Taliban. What is your comment on that? Well, we have a little um, historical experience there, too, uh, all over the world, in fact, with regimes that the U.S. has instituted, like the, uh, I mean, in Indonesia, Guatemala, all over the place, and total horror, some of the worst horror stories of the 20th century. But just let's take uh, Afghanistan. Uh, where did the Taliban come from? Where did the Taliban regime come from? Well, you know, its roots are in uh, 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 operations organized beginning in 1979 by the CIA, uh, French intelligence, uh, Egypt, uh, backing from um, Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, uh, to try to organize uh, a, uh, 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 an army of uh, radical uh, Islamic fundamentalists to carry out a holy war. Uh, if we can believe uh, former National Security Advisor Brzezinski, Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, he takes credit for having, uh, <clears throat> as he puts it, drawn the Russians into an Afghan trap, that's his phrase, in 1979 by beginning to send aid to Mujahideen who were fighting in, again against the government in the hope that the Russians would intervene and fall into an Afghan trap. Uh, that is reminiscent of uh, French Foreign Minister Vidrin's words the other day about <clears throat> the United States falling into a diabolical trap set by bin Laden, and he may have been thinking of it because French intelligence was in fact uh, instrumental in drawing the Russians into the Afghan trap. Incidentally, I say, if we believe Brzezinski, which is a question, he may be bragging, uh, but that's the claim, at least. Uh, the, uh, uh, the CIA and its associates uh, did look for the um, best killers they could find, naturally, with who happened to be uh, 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 radical Islamists, what are called here fundamentalists. Uh, and uh, they were brutal and murderous. Uh, the U.S. armed them, trained them. They carried out terrorist attacks inside Russia with CIA support. And ultimately, and, uh, incidentally, they almost immediately turned against their creators. So one of their first acts was to assassinate President Sadat of Egypt, who was uh, the most enthusiastic of the coalition that was forming them. That was 1981. Um, 1983, a single suicide bomber probably loosely connected to the same network, uh, drove the U.S. military out of uh, Lebanon virtually. Uh, and uh, uh, it continued by after, the, after, the, after the Russians did withdraw from Afghanistan, possibly delayed by these actions, many specialists believe, anyway, did withdraw. And that war was won. Uh, they simply turned elsewhere. I mean, since then, they've been carrying out uh, terrorist attacks in, uh, against their main enemies. Uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, other uh, 
corrupt and repressive governments of the region, which they regard as un-Islamic, and those who support them. And they're fighting in Chechnya, they're fighting in western China, Kashmir, uh, Bosnia. Uh, uh, I mean, the roots of Hamas and Gaza and the West, and the, uh, uh, west Bank go back there, too. And they're attacking the United States, uh, which uh, bin Laden himself has... Uh, He's been very you know, outspoken about this, no, no big secret. Uh, when U.S. forces uh, established a permanent uh, military base in uh, Saudi Arabia, the one from which they're now planning to, or at least saying they're going to bomb Afghanistan, uh, he and his network immediately described that as comparable to the Russian occupation of Afghanistan, although far worse because of Saudi Arabia's significance as the uh, site of the you know, holiest uh, shrines and so on. Uh, so then, yes, going to go to war against them, just as the CIA uh, trained them to go to war against the uh, Russian occupiers. Uh, so, so there is a history of U.S. Uh, and out of this, in the U.S. came the Taliban. I mean, it, you know, it's a couple of years later, but it sort of grows out of the same uh, of the same uh, uh, networks and backgrounds. Uh, so uh, we can we have we already have succeeded in, and and after the Russians withdrew, uh, the mujahideen, the the various uh, groups that had been formed and created, they just tore the country apart. In fact, they destroyed the place. And one of the reasons why the Taliban, terrible as they are, were more or less welcomed, is that they at least uh, you know calmed the uh, uh, the uh, uh, in, internal battling that was destroying destroying what was left of the country. So we have uh, 20 years of experience in Afghanistan itself of U.S. efforts to establish a regime. Yeah, and it ends up with the Taliban. Osa, uh, Noam, what do you think is the most important um, thing to understand about Osama bin Laden? And do you think that the U.S. government has the evidence uh, to demand uh, that he be sent out of Afghanistan or to say that he's a prime suspect? Well, you know, if you ask my opinion, I would assume that Osama bin Laden and his network are responsible for the for this act. However, the stress should be on the word network. Uh, it's a very loosely affiliated, non-hierarchic structure. It's, a, you know, in a way, it's familiar to the kind of affinity groups we're used to. You know. Uh, the a, a non-hierarchic, decentralized structure <clears throat> it immediately come, develops in resistance situations and others because it's essentially immune to penetration. Uh, the, uh, it's not likely that uh, Osama bin Laden hiding in some cave in Afghanistan was able to literally direct uh, an operation as uh, uh, sophisticated and horrendous as the one that took place on September 11th, but it probably goes out of the loose network. I mean, Bush said last night that these are in 60 countries all over the place, and that's right. Uh, if the United, uh, the, uh, much of the world has been asking for evidence. So a couple of days ago, the Arab League said, uh, if you can provide us with some evidence, we will join the attack against uh, this kind of terrorism, which they hate even more than the United States does, because they're the main victims of it, targets of it. Uh, but the United States can't present the evidence, and it's not likely that they'll be able to. You, it's going to be hard to find credible evidence about a structure like that, in which most of the people, the people directly involved, kill themselves. So you can't go after them. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, not only the network, but even its financial resources are, you know, informal, uh, limited, spread all over the place uh, to try to to literally destroy the network and all of its supporters would mean destroying you know half the world. Uh, it's uh, uh, in, in this sense the the call for. Uh, I mean, NATO too has asked for specific for evidence, and they can't get it. But the it's a plausible surmise that that's what's behind it. Well, what do you do in such a case? You, you have two choices. Uh, you can uh, um, just go bomb, you know, kill maybe millions of Afghans, and then answer Bin Laden's prayers, escalate the cycle of violence. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, the alternative is to pursue, is to follow the statement of the uh, uh, U.S. bishops that was uh, announced yesterday. Follow national and international law. That means pursue the uh, series of steps that, for example, Nicaragua pursued. I mean, I presume they had the uh, capacity.
capacity to set off bombs in Washington, even if not to bomb the United States. They didn't. They went to the World Court, uh, received the decision in their favor, went to the Security Council, the U.S. blocked it, went to the General Assembly several times, a unanimous vote that the U.S. should stop its attack, uh, U.S. and Israel opposed, uh, and then they couldn't do anything more. Uh, but nobody's going to stop the United States if it follows the uh, the proper principles of, uh, uh, of uh, national and international law. I mean, let's take a domestic example, just you know, no two cases are similar, but it tells you something. Let's take the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City. Uh, the initial calls, as I'm sure you remember, were let's bomb the Middle East, okay, you know, kill, the, kill the bastards. Uh, it was, and if there had been any link, however minimal, to the, to the Middle East, that's probably what would have happened. When it was found to have its roots in the U.S. militia movement, those calls stopped. Uh, nobody called for bombing uh, Montana and Idaho to root out the whole militia movement. Uh, they went after the perpetrator, tried to discover the perpetrator. They found him, uh, brought him to the courts. Uh, and then comes the next step, if you're serious. Why did it happen? Uh, you look into the roots of uh, the militia movement. And the fact of the matter is, and we should be honest enough to face this, that when it, almost every crime you can think of, whether it's a robbery in the streets or a colossal atrocity, there are some reasons behind it. And if you're serious, if, you're, if you want to reduce the threat of further crimes rather than enhance them, uh, what you do is look into the reasons. And you almost invariably find that some among, among those reasons, whether it's Oklahoma City or um, you know, World Trade Center or a crime in the streets, uh, some of them are serious, and they ought to be addressed. And again, it, you have a choice. If you want to reduce the threat of violence, you think about those things. If you want to escalate the threat of violence against yourself as well, then you disregard it and just lash out violently. Those are almost always the choices. In the case of Oklahoma City, the proper response after following the right criminal procedures uh, was to look into the reasons and ask where this is coming from and try to, and insofar as they're authentic and to some extent they are, uh, alleviate them. Well, Noam Chomsky, I want to thank you very much for being with us. As usual, it's not enough time, but uh, thank you for the beginning. British Prime Minister Tony Blair was in New York yesterday visiting Ground Zero with a group of U.S. senators and pledging British military assistance in what seems uh, to be an imminent U.S. war against Afghanistan. Britain lost more than 300 of its citizens in the attacks last week. Blair's uh, visit... Thousands of Afghanis uh, have fled the country in terror, and the U.N. is warning of massive starvation if food and other aid is not brought in immediately. This morning, British journalist and filmmaker John Pilger wrote in the Guardian newspaper, During my lifetime, America has been constantly waging war against much of humanity, impoverished people mostly in stricken places. Moreover, far from being the main perpetrators of terrorism, Islamic peoples have been its victims, more often than not of an American fundamentalism and its proxies. The Bush administration's march to war and British support, Pilger argues, promises more of the same. John Pilger is a world-renowned journalist and filmmaker. Among his films, Death of a Nation about East Timor, films about Cambodia, Burma, Iraq, and most recently, Globalization and Indonesia. He joins us on the telephone from London. I spoke to him just before the program began and asked him about the British response to the attack on the World Trade Center towers and the Pentagon, and now President Bush's response to that. Well, the opinion polls are saying that uh, two-thirds of the country support military action and a third are opposed to it, uh, but that half the country is opposed to uh, any all-out war. Now, I don't know what really what the questions that uh, led to um, th that kind of result in the polls. Um, but at the moment, uh, a majority would support the Blair government's policies, uh, which have been, as you know, to uh, unequivocally support the Bush administration.
Last night in President Bush's speech, um, he said, America has no truer friend than Great Britain. Once again, we're joined together in a great cause. I'm so honored the British Prime Minister has crossed an ocean to show his unity with America. Thank you for coming, friend. Well, once together, they're joined to, to uh, they're joined together in um, yet another uh, uncertain imperial adventure. I mean, uh, uh, when uh, 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 Britain handed the imperial torch to the United States uh, shortly after the Second World War, uh, its consolation was to be given the status of um, a, a lieutenant. Uh, and that's what it has been uh, very faithfully over the years. So um, putting aside the irony and uh, the unintended irony in President Bush's remarks, um, he speaks um, yeah, what he said is correct. Two days after the attacks, you wrote a piece, far from being the terrorists of the world, the Islamic peoples have been its victims. Can you talk more about that? Well, undoubtedly, the whole uh, notion that uh, the Islamic peoples are now the terrorists of the world is absurd. Uh, just in numbers, uh, they must be uh, among the uh, the single uh, 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 greatest uh, <coughs> number of victims of terrorism. Uh, just the Palestinian peoples have been that for 34 years and longer. Uh, the people of Iraq um, have uh, lost uh, at least a million people and uh, half a million children in the uh, uh, Anglo-American uh, imposed embargo against that country. Um, the, um, if you, um, the so-called Afghan Arabs, as uh, they're referred to, uh, people of, of South Asia were, of course, uh, the Mujahideen uh, uh, were uh, partly the creation of Anglo-American intelligence. Um, and so it goes on. I mean, it goes back longer than that. It goes back to the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, uh, the, uh, the deep anger felt in Egypt, where one of the extreme Muslim organizations, the Muslim Brotherhood, was founded, uh it's it's uh, much much of the the the, the so-called islamic extremism comes from is a legacy of imperialism uh, and uh the muslim and uh arab peoples have certainly been uh a victims of that imperialism middle east has and the gulf have been a cockpit of upheaval um partly because of war, partly because of strategic struggle between the various imperial powers for a very long time. The Royal Air Force of Britain has been bombing uh, that part of the world since the 1920s. So um, uh, I, I wouldn't like to make a league table of who are the victims of terrorism, but uh, at a guess I would have thought the Islamic people, those peoples are um, uh, near the top. We're talking to British filmmaker and journalist John Pilger. His latest film is The New Rulers of the World. Uh, you write in your piece um, how at the time of the attacks you were writing about Palestine and censorship. Uh, BBC and CNN uh, recently in the last months uh, have sent out memos to their staff, uh, BBC not to uh, call killings of Palestinians assassination, CNN not to talk about um, the Jewish settlements in the West Bank, uh, Gaza, in the, in the occupied territories, illegal settlements. How would you, um, how do you describe the media that you are seeing right now? Well, in the case you mentioned of the BBC, I mean, the BBC has a, a very considerable reputation because it's of, of its very high production values. Uh, and uh, really that makes the, the kind of broadcasting that it does and the distortions in the coverage of the Middle East even greater, in my opinion, uh, the BBC has long drawn a moral equivalence between oppressor and oppressed in the Middle East. 
And the uh, example that you've just uh, mentioned doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, although over here, I think, maybe in contrast to the United States, I'm not sure, but I think over here there's been considerable enlightenment in recent years about the Middle East. People, I think, are no longer intimidated against uh, being critical of Israel, so with the fear that they might be called anti-Semitic. Um, I think that's going rapidly. But all the same, the general coverage over here of the Middle East uh, really uh, is still adheres to um, uh, an, an Israeli news agenda. Uh, the, the Palestinians are generally cast as the people who uh, plant bombs and blow up people and are the terrorists. Israel is seldom, almost never identified as a terror state operating as an invader uh, uh, against uh, an occupied people. How is the British press uh, covering the drumbeat to war? Uh, for example, President Bush is addressed at air on nationwide television in Britain, and how are they framing it? Well, I think the majority of them are beating the drum, but there has been more um, discussion than I've known for a long time, much more discussion, open discussion, than, say, during the NATO uh, action against uh, Yugoslavia a couple of years ago. Um, I think there has been... I think there has been a response to a real public hunger, a need to make sense of all this and to debate it, and a fear, a fear of what America and Britain are about to do next. Whilst they, are, they support, the majority support the pursuit of, um, of, of uh, 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 the, the, the pursuit of the people who are responsible for the atrocities in the United States, there's, there's widespread misgivings, and I think this has been reflected unusually, perhaps, in the press, which usually closes ranks, as it did, as I say, during the Kosovo operation, as it did uh, during the Gulf War. Um, the Guardian newspaper, which took a very pro-war position in the last two instances uh, I mentioned, has, um, has allowed... Um, a number of uh, articles very critical of the Blair administration, including one by me, which is in The Guardian this morning. Um, so that, that to me, represents um, a, a response to uh, a, a t certain tensions within, within, uh, within the public here at the moment and, and confusion as to what is what is happening, and as I say, a fear and insecurity about what might happen. John Pilger, President Bush said last night, if you are not with us, you're with the terrorists. Well, President Bush says a lot of things that um, kind of just come out of a, a sort of B-movies I used to watch in Australia as a kid. Um, and uh, The Guardian's... Uh, principal political cartoonist, uh, a minor genius called Steve Bell, uh, represents P President Bush uh, daily as, uh, frankly, an idiot. Uh, I don't think it really matters what President Bush says. I think President Bush is uh, just one of a Bush team, and that team goes back to uh, the great... Um, uh, the great warlord, uh, George Bush Sr. I, I think that uh, Bush, um, Bush uh, that uh, it seems to me that uh, Cheney and uh, all the others uh, from, the, from his father's era uh, are really running the show. And, uh, um, you know, Ronald Reagan used to say pretty stupid things, but... Um, uh, I think that uh, there are some very uh, serious and uh, worrying people behind him. 
John Pilger, you're well known uh, for your films on East Timor, Death of a Nation, and also on Cambodia, um, one of the frequent guests on U.S. television, I assume uh, on international TV as well, is Henry Kissinger as an expert on terrorism, but um, not well, in the sense... in a strange way, yeah. What's that? He's, um, he, would, um, he would have personal knowledge of it, I'm sure. What about that, um, framing him as an older statesman? Well, you know, the Kissinger record is there. I mean, it's, on the, it's in the public domain. I don't see really what the debate is. And, but I think, I think there's a growing public awareness, consciousness of just of what Kissinger has done over the years. As far as East Timor is concerned, we've seen the minutes of... Uh, of uh, his meetings um, uh, at uh, the State Department in 1975, when he was approving the um, when he was approving the covert uh, uh, shipment of weapons and aid to the Indonesians, just as they were beginning their slaughter in East Timor. Um, I think his historical role um, is becoming assured, and it's not really the one that he would want. Finally, you write that only someone who has never seen the effects of cluster bombs um, could talk as Tony Blair and uh, Bush have. Well, we just spoke to family members um, who saw the effects of terror and, and destruction at the World Trade Center towers. One lost her brother, another her husband, and they want nothing to do with uh, bringing uh, more death to more people. What is your response? They are rarely seen, these views, though they're brought on to describe, um, you know, their family member that they've lost and what happened in those hours. They're rarely asked the second question, the actual victims, and that is, what would you like to see done? It's very difficult to talk to grieving people. I'm not really for that. I don't like doing that. I think it's wrong to ask them their opinions uh, when they're consumed by grief. But some of them have given them voluntarily some very brave opinions, and we've had some of the British victims of the World Trade Center bombings. One, uh, uh, one, one man is quoted this morning as saying that Bush ought to be caged. This is not, uh, I think it was his brother, I'm not sure, but I think it was his brother who died. And he, uh, just paraphrasing him, he felt his brother didn't die for a lot of other innocent people to die. That's a very, that's a very admirable logic expressed by someone who must be grieving so deeply. Uh, I, my own <laughs> public opinion poll would be that most human beings would believe that, that there's, only, there's one truth in all of this, and that is the killing of innocent people in New York and in Washington is indefensible uh, and cannot be justified. And the killing of innocent people anywhere in the world is indefensible and cannot be justified. John Pilger, British journalist and filmmaker. His latest film is The New Rulers of the World. His book is Hidden Agenda, speaking to us from London. As we continue with this media special, we are broadcasting on the Internet at webactive.com and wbix.org. We're broadcasting on public access television, Channel 56 on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. You, too, can get us on your public access station. You can just uh, record uh, from Dish Network, uh, Free Speech TV, and you can call them in Boulder, Colorado. And we're also broadcasting on Pacifica affiliates around the country, as well as Pacifica Station, KPFA in Berkeley, broadcasting from near Ground Zero, just blocks from uh, where the World Trade Center once stood. And today there are protests planned, as usual, in New York. There have been many peace activities. Uh, last night I was handed postcards that said, Islam is not the enemy, war is not the answer, let's work to end the cycle, pass it on. And another in bright orange um, psychedelic colors, our grief is not a cry for war. 
Uh, before we go to students around the country, Sunita Mehta has returned to the firehouse, a member of Women for Afghan Women and Saki for South Asian Women. Um, and she is one of the organizers of a Muslim peace vigil that was supposed to be in New York tonight. Last night, police revoke the permit. Why? Why? 